I think it, uh, we can start now and people will still trickle in. Um, I'm Barry Goodison. I cha I'm chair of the CMOS Ottawa Centre and on behalf of the centre, very pleased to welcome everybody to 2022. This is our first luncheon talk of the uh, new year, uh, virtual, uh, as we all know. But um, really pleased you could join us. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Probably when you clicked in, you noted that uh, this session is being recorded and uh, that will be posted to the CMOS YouTube channel uh, a few days after today. And we found that that uh, adds uh, considerable viewership. Those that can't make it uh, live today, they make it uh, uh, able to look at it later. So it's a very useful tool. And as mentioned, if you can turn off your video, a couple of people still have it on. If you can turn off your video and your audio, just to, uh, as Denise said, but except for the uh, uh, speakers. And um, for the questions, the question and the answer format that we use, we use the chat function and ask that you type your question in there. And uh, then at the uh, uh, end, uh, Ada Lowen will uh, handle those uh, um, Q and A's, and she may combine, if similar questions occur, she may combine it. So, you know, don't expect it always to be read out uh, verbatim. Uh, she has that discretion. Um, and uh, for the questions, I'll, we have two speakers today, but we'll do the questions at the end of both talks or at the end of the talks. So both will speak and then the questions will be handled at the very end. So given that, I'd like to turn over uh, the introductions to Ada Lowen, who is the uh, Carlton student representative for our center and has been incredibly helpful in uh, uh, getting people engaged and browbeating them if necessary, including professors. But uh, Anyways, I'll turn it over to you, Ada, to introduce your colleagues. Thank you. Your mic is muted, Ada. Thanks. There you I go. Wasn't, I wasn't able to unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Barry, for um, handing over to me. So I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers today, Trevor Anderson and Ashton. Um, Stutzler, who will be uh, each given be given talks about their graduate research related to factors that influence highway conditions in the Yukon. Uh, Trevor and Astrid are both master students in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University under the supervision of Dr. Chris Byrne. Um, and Trevor is also co-supervised by Dr. Ian, Ian McKendry from UBC. Uh, they're both, they've both been working with the transportation and engineering branch of the government of Yukon for this research. Um, and as Barry mentioned, Trevor and Astro will be presenting right after each other, so I'll introduce both their talks right now. Trevor's talk is titled Synoptic Conditions Leading to Storm Force Winds in Hurricane Alley, Kilometer 450 to 465 Dempster Highway, Yukon. Um, and Trevor has a few firsthand experiences with extreme wind events uh, from going on vacation with his family in Florida during Hurricane Charlie and um, previous experiences traveling, um, working with another master's student in Hurricane Alley prior to starting his own research. Um, and after Trevor, we'll hear from Astrid uh, talking about increases in maintenance costs for highways due to climate change in Yukon. And I'm looking forward to hearing um, about her perspectives on translating scientific research into policy development. Uh, so now let Trevor start his presentation um, whenever he is ready. Right, so I hope everybody should be able to uh, see my screen right now. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Ada, for the introduction, um, and good afternoon to everyone on this call. As Ada mentioned, my name is Trevor Anderson, uh, and I'm a Master's of Science Geography student at Carleton University. Uh, and I would like to thank you all for attending this luncheon talk. Um, 
and as well as offering me the opportunity to discuss my research project. So my project itself is focused on the strong windstorms which occur along a 15 kilometer section of the North Dempster Highway in the Yukon, uh, also known as Hurricane Alley. Uh, so before I get into the main section of my talk, uh, I would like to start off with a video demonstrating the strong winds which occur in the Hurricane Alley area. Uh, with a video. So this is a dash cam video from a truck traveling along the Dempster Highway, uh, just north of the Yukon and Northwest Territories border. So the truck encounters strong downslope winds uh, and the flat, flat truck, the flat side of the truck essentially acts as a sail and the truck is blown completely off the road. Uh, fortunately, the driver was okay and another motorist was passing by right after them and able to render assistance. Uh, but this video acts as a good showcase of the effects of the hazard which the strong winds pose on infrastructure, uh, as well as a reminder of why it is important to study them. Um, so for my talk today, I will provide a brief overview of the study site, as well as the mechanisms behind the strong winds in Hurricane Alley. Uh, I will then continue with discussing the limited previous work conducted in researching these strong winds, including a conference paper from a recent Carleton graduate student, uh, as well as a modeling report from the weather forecast research team from the University of British Columbia. Uh, I will then continue with a discussion of recent data from Hurricane Alley, as well as a few of the tools which I've been working with this to, so far to study the strong winds. Uh, and finally, I will finish off with a few comments on the future directions of my research. Uh, so starting off with a brief description of my study site. So Hurricane Alley is located between kilometers 450 uh, and 465 of the Dempster Highway in the Yukon. So these are the final 15 kilometers of the highway before the territorial border. Uh, the Dempster Highway is Canada's only all season highway serving the Western Canadian Arctic. And it runs from the Klondike Highway near Dawson City to Inuvik. And in Hurricane Alley, the highway runs south to north parallel to a ridge uh, on the east side of the road. And for much of Hurricane Alley, the elevation is between about 650 to 750 meters for the highway. Uh, and the ridge top elevation is between 950 and 1,150 meters. And in winter, the ridge often causes strong downslope windstorms where winds may exceed 100 kilometers per hour, uh, hence the name Hurricane Alley. Um, now there are several meteorological stations in the region which have been recording these strong winds notably uh, Rock River, which is an Environment and Climate Change Canada station, and that's located at Yukon Kilometer 457. And there is also a Northwest Tell station at the border uh, and a Transport Canada station located at Kilometer 8.5 on the Northwest Territory side. And in October last year, there were also several additional meteorological stations installed in the region. Um, so the, yeah, the downslope winter windstorms in Hurricane Alley commonly produce winds in excess of 100 kilometers per hour, uh, and occasionally result in hurricane force winds of at least 119 kilometers per hour. So the windstorms characteristically follow a phone mechanism. So what we have here is cold air pools on the east side of the ridge, uh, so behind this ridge in the picture, uh, and then upper air layers which are slightly warmer spill over the ridge top and accelerate down slope and then blow perpendicularly across the highway at a strong speed. Um, and this can cause hazardous road conditions, of course, due to blue, blowing and drifting snow, poor visibility, uh, as well as the strong winds themselves, such as in the video I showed earlier. Uh, although that video I showed uh, showcases strong westerly winds on the Northwest Territory side of the ridge, uh, essentially it's just sort of the opposite Mechanisms, so you have cold air pooling on the west side of the ridge in Hurricane Alley and then spilling over onto the Northwest Territory side. Um, and approximately 70% of highway closures in the Eagle Plains Maintenance Division of the Dempster Highway are due to poor weather in Hurricane Alley, uh, even though Hurricane Alley only makes up about 8% of the total section length. Uh, and I should also note that despite the hazard posed by these windstorms, uh, they are not particularly well forecast by Environment Canada, uh, mainly because the forecast models used by Environment Canada operate with grid cells on the order of 10 to 15 kilometers wide, uh, which is too large to accurately capture the topographic effects of the ridge. So 
Before continuing, I would like to briefly make note of the fact that downslope windstorms occur in alpine areas around the world. Uh, although studies are much less common at higher latitudes and in more remote locations. So the figure on this slide is from a recent journal art article from the International Journal of Climatology, uh, which modeled regions where downslope winds are expected to occur. And the darker colors are areas where downslope winds are more common. So regionally or globally known winds can easily be located on this map. Uh, for instance, the Chinooks to the east of the Rockies, uh, the Santa Ana winds of Southern California, the Zonda winds of South America, and so on. Um, but other regions susceptible to downslope windstorms, including the Richardson Mountains, where Hurricane Alley is located, uh, can also be noted on this map. So shifting my focus to some of the past research work, which has been carried out in Hurricane Alley, uh, a previous master's student at Carleton University, Jen Humphreys, also worked in Hurricane Alley, um, though it wasn't related to the strong winds themselves, uh, though she did write a conference article which compared wind characteristics among meteorological stations in the border region. Uh, so these were four stations, Rock River, the Environment Canada station at kilometer 457, as well as three Transport Canada stations located at kilometer 421 in the Yukon uh, and kilometers 8.5 and 51.5 in the Northwest Territories. So data analysis showed that the storm force winds on the Beaufort scale, winds exceeding or reaching 89 kilometers per hour or higher, uh, only occurred at Rock River, while gale force winds, those 50 kilometers per hour or higher, occurred 9% 9, 9 of the time at Rock River, but 1% or less of the time at the other three stations. Uh, and interestingly, the data also suggested that while the strongest windstorms occur in the winter, uh, wind speeds are on average higher in the summer. And this figure is just, um, it just displays the wind data between 2014 and 2018 for the four stations as wind roses. Uh, and a few things to point out here. So gale force winds and stronger, um, quite common at Rock River and less common at the other three stations. Um, and also on the west side of the ridge in the Yukon, uh, prevailing winds are predominantly easterly. Um, and in the, on the Northwest Territories side to the east of the ridge, the prevailing winds are more southwesterly. And uh, past research into the windstorms in Hurricane Alley was also conducted by the weather forecast research team from the University of British Columbia. Uh, I know a few of them are on this call today. Um, so yeah, basically what they tried to do was attempt to model five previous windstorms uh, during the winter of 2019 to 2020 using four different grid cell spacings at 9, 3, 1, and 0 0.33 kilometers, uh, keeping in mind that these grid cell spacings are smaller than the ones used by Environment Canada forecasts. Uh, and the team noted that using the smaller grid cells greatly increased the accuracy of the model wind speeds uh, when compared to the Rock River records. And the image on this slide shows the model output Put for one of the windstorm events with uh, grid cell spacings of 0 0.33 kilometers. And you can see how a lot of the road as it passes through Hurricane Alley is modeled to be in areas with wind speeds between 75 and 90 kilometers per hour. Uh, and there are a few areas of modeled wind speeds in excess of 90 kilometers per hour near Rock River. Uh, and the team also noted that the strong winds commonly developed by the phone mechanism with uh, you know, all the cold air pulling on the east side of the ridge and resulting in quite calm conditions and then spilling over the ridge top and accelerating downslope towards the highway. Uh, and I should also note that something called hydraulic jumps, which I'll come back to in a moment, uh, were also modeled and you can see those in this event with the calm conditions uh, sort of to the west of Rock River. Um, so this figure, it's continuing with the UBC report, and it shows a comparison between forecasts and observed wind speeds uh, during this windstorm event. Uh, so the blue circles are the hourly wind speed recorded at Rock River, and then all of the many lines are the forecasts. Uh, the key ones to keep in mind are this black dashed line, which is the Environment Canada forecast. Um, and it basically completely missed this event. Uh, wind speeds of 30 kilometers per hour were forecast throughout. Um, but then if you look at the colored lines, these are all the UBC forecasts. Um, 
an order of decrease in grid cell size. And you can see when the grid cell size is one kilometer or less, the forecasts were actually fairly accurate. Um, and coming back to hydraulic jumps, which I mentioned a moment ago, uh, so these are a feature of fluid dynamics where a decrease in the velocity of fluid is associated with an increase in vertical height. Uh, so a more technical description would be that hydraulic jumps occur during the transition between supercritical and subcritical flow. So that is the fluid transitions from a state where it is moving faster than information can travel back upstream um, to a state where information travels faster back upstream than the fluid is moving. Uh, in other words, in supercritical flow, upstream fluid will not be able to feel the effects of the downstream object, uh, whereas in subcritical flow, downstream objects can affect upstream flow. Um, and while this is commonly discussed in um, water motion, you know, for instance, after a dam or weir and how that affects the water, uh, it can also be thought of in an atmospheric way as well. So in Hurricane Alley, uh, essentially what you have is a layer of air moves down the ridge um, and it accelerates under the force of gravity. And it's also constrained against the ridge slope as well, as well because it is colder and slightly denser than air layers above. And once it reaches the foot of the slope, it decelerates um, and is no longer constrained against the slope. And this results in an increase in vertical depth, a decrease in wind speed, uh, as well as an increase in turbulence. And so if we look at the December 2019 windstorm again, um, we can consider the image to the left of this slide. Uh, it displays a cross section of the lower atmosphere as well as a hydraulic jump. So the wind speed increases down the slope towards the highway, resulting in strong winds at the highway. Um, but a few kilometers to the west of the highway, you can see this area of much calmer conditions. Um, and this is the hydraulic jump, and you can see the vertical depth of the air layer also greatly increases. Um, and on the right hand side of this slide is a Facebook comment I was sent by Emma Stockton, who is a Carleton PhD student working out of Inuvik. Uh, and it basically details how there's a lot more snow deposition in this winter on the Yukon side of the border compared to the Northwest Territories side. Um, it could just be due to difference in maintenance procedures between the two territorial governments and their contractors, um, but it could also potentially imply that the hydraulic jump is further east than where it was a couple of years ago. Um, so, so far this winter, we have noticed that windstorms appear somewhat less common and weaker, while blizzards and snowfalls have appeared to be more common. Uh, so potentially the weaker windstorms and enhanced snowfall may mean that the hydraulic jump was moved slightly further east than it was in previous winters. And just considering wind data from recent years between October and March at Rock River can give us the following baseline data. So for 2019 to 2020, the average wind speed over the six month time span was about 17.9 kilometers per hour. And winds reached storm force, so at least 89 kilometers per hour for 51 hours across seven storm events. And gale force winds of at least 50 kilometers per hour occurred for around 560 hours. Um, and 2020 to 2021 was quite a bit calmer than 2019-20, uh, especially in terms of average wind speed and the number of hours with gale force winds. And the current winter seems to be approximately on par with 2019-2020, although all of the storm force winds that have occurred so far at Rock River uh, occurred in November, which is somewhat earlier than we would expect. And then shifting my focus, um, I wanted to talk briefly about some of the resources I've been using so far to study the strong winds. Uh, so the figure on this slide outlines a strong windstorm, which occurred during late December 2019. Uh, the black dotted line is the hourly recorded wind at Rock River, and then the blue line is the Environment Canada forecast. And even though this forecast from Environment Canada is somewhat more accurate than the previous event I used with showing the uh, UBC modeling, um, it still did not accurately capture the strongest winds during this windstorm. Um, I should also note that uh, the wind direction was predominantly easterly during the strongest winds and then more variable during the calmer periods of this wind event. Um, and then on this slide, I have some synoptic scale tools which can be used to assess the winds on a local scale in Hurricane Alley. 
So on the right, we have an Environment Canada analysis chart for pressure at sea level. And this chart represents a snapshot in time close to when peak winds occurred during this windstorm event. Uh, and it also represents a common scenario associated with strong winds in Hurricane Alley. And generally what we see is a high pressure region you know, in the Mackenzie Delta area or further north over the Beaufort Sea, as well as a low pressure extratropical cyclone moving northeasterly through the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, and this builds up a north-south pressure gradient resulting in synoptic scale easterly winds in the Richardson Mountains area. Uh, and sometimes the cyclone can make it over the St. Elias Mountains into south central Yukon, uh, while other times it just sits parked on the Alaskan coast and builds up the pressure gradient throughout the Yukon, which can also result in strong winds. Uh, and then on the left side of this slide, we have a high split model 72 hour output from NOAA. So the high split model or hybrid single particle Lagrangian integrated tra trajectory model. Uh, it's commonly used to track the spread of pollutants throughout the atmosphere, uh, but in this case, I used it to map the theoretical path of an air parcel, which you know, passes through all these circulations and then arrives at Rock River. Uh, and so the two images can be compared, compared with each other, with the air parcel originating somewhere near the polar high uh, and then spiraling cyclonically around the low pressure center in the Beaufort Sea and then anti-cyclonically around the high pressure center in the Mackenzie Delta area before arriving at Rock River from the east or northeast. Uh, just keep in mind though that the analysis chart is a snapshot in time while the high split output is over time. So the pressure centers are somewhat offset from where they would have been when the air parcel passed. Um, and then based on some of the information I presented before, um, I've begun a sort of quick forecasting, which uses easily available resources and tools in an attempt to forecast the likelihood of strong winds in Rock River, uh, since the Environment Canada forecasts aren't always particularly accurate. So the idea here is that someone who's interested in knowing if strong winds are likely, you know, over the next 24 hours or so, um, but who doesn't necessarily have a background in atmospheric science, they could access these resources and attempt to have a rudimentary idea of what the wind conditions will be like. Um, so some of the resources I've been using so far include the analysis charts, uh, historical data from Environment Canada and other sources, uh, windy.com, as well as 511 Yukon. Uh, so this is a new site which maps transportation conditions across the territory. And although there haven't been too many strong wind events in December and January to test this on, um, my results so far seem mildly successful. So of the 24 times I predicted uh, strong winds to be highly unlikely or unlikely over the next 24 hours, uh, in 19 of the cases, the winds did not exceed gale force. Of the 14 times I predicted strong winds to be possible in Hurricane Alley, four did exceed gale force. Uh, and then of the six times I predicted strong winds to be highly likely or likely, three exceeded gale force conditions, so greater than 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, and then in addition to continuing the analysis from some of these data sources, um, I'm also help, hoping to have access from several new stations which have been installed in Hurricane Alley. Um, and so these anemometers were installed in the highway right of way at several locations. So Yukon kilometer 450, 454, 457 near Rock River, 459, uh, at the territorial border and then at kilometer four on the Northwest Territories side. Um, there was also a planned station that we wanted to install off the right of way up the ridge around kilometer 453. Uh, however, it wasn't able to be installed. Um, but yeah, these stations were installed in October and have been recording and transmitting data through the GOES satellite network. And we're still waiting to get access to the data, but hopefully once we do have access, uh, these new stations will allow me to analyze how windstorms develop at different points within Hurricane Alley, as well as to observe windstorms on the Northwest Territories side of the border when the strong winds are westerly. Um, so just to close off, I would like to again emphasize how windstorms in Hurricane Alley pose a hazard to a critical piece of infrastructure, uh, that is the Dempster Highway, but they're poorly understood at present and often inaccurately forecast. 
so my research aims to fill in the research gap as often associated with studies of downslope windstorms in remote and high latitude regions. And finally, I just want to thank you all for attending and listening to my talk. Uh, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions in the question period at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor, for that great presentation. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Astrid Tretzar, and I'm a master's student in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University. Uh, today, I'll be giving a presentation on my master's research, which is titled Increases in Maintenance Costs for Highways Due to Climate Change in Yukon. So I'll be starting out my presentation giving a quick overview of climate change in Northwest Canada, including both changes in temperature and precipitation. Next, I'll be introducing some of the challenges experienced by highway infrastructure in the Yukon and the type of maintenance that is required to keep up with these challenges. I'll then be talking about the main research objectives and present some early results from both the Alaska Highway in the south and the Dempster Highway in the north of Yukon. Um, and then I'll finish off my presentation with some main conclusions. So these two figures display a general overview of the rate of climate change in different parts of Canada. The figure on the left uh, shows the observed annual temperature change between 1948 to 2016 across Canada. And we can see in this figure that the greatest temperature change in the last 70 years has been measured in Northern Canada and particularly in the Western Arctic. The figure on the right shows the running mean of 10 years in air temperature plotted for the Mackenzie Delta area and Ottawa. And to accommodate both trends on the same graph, the scale for the Mackenzie Delta can be found on the left and the scale for Ottawa on the right. And similar to the map, uh, the rates of change in southern Canada are lower than in the north. However, there is still an increasing trend um, in both. And these images provide a clear demonstration of the Arctic amplification that is occurring. Uh, so climate change is also associated with increases in precipitation. However, due to greater spatial variation, these changes are often very difficult to detect, especially in northern remote regions uh, where there's limited climate stations. Um, however, in this normal probability plot, um, the magnitude of annual rainfall is plotted against the probability of exceedance for a 60 year period to illustrate a regime shift of precipitation. So in a normal distribution, each 20 year interval should contribute six to seven events to the upper, middle and lower 20 points on the graph. However, we can see here that in Anuvik, there's an overrepresentation of recent rainfall totals with 10 out of 20 years in the upper third of the distribution. And we believe that this is evidence which demonstrates that an adjustment in the precipitation regime is taking place. In addition to this, we're also seeing warming of the shoulder seasons, including both fall and spring, which has resulted in change in the form of precipitation with snowfall often being uh, replaced by rain. So next, uh, I'd like to show a quick video that was made by myself and Sam Faye Balamingi, and she's a videographer who joined us uh, on our field work to the Yukon this summer as we traveled across the different highways in the territory. Almost half of Canada sits on permanently frozen ground, or permafrost. Permafrost can be defined as earth materials that remain at or below zero degrees Celsius for at least two consecutive years. However, as climate change continues and air temperatures rise, the once permanently frozen ground begins to thaw. In the Yukon, much of the road infrastructure is underlain by permafrost, and much of it is ice rich, which means that as the ice in the ground melts, there's a loss of volume beneath the road and causes the ground to consolidate, leading to the development of sinkholes and deterioration of the road surface. Thaw slumps are a type of landslide that occur in permafrost environments. This slump, found only a kilometer away from the Dempster Highway, has an exposed 20-meter headwall full of ice-rich permafrost. In 2017, continued warming and rainfall caused the slump to rapidly grow and form a debris tongue that stopped only 200 meters from the highway. These slumps are occurring more frequently and growing rapidly, 
risking infrastructure and safety of highways. The ground is melting and uh, the highway has about 1,100 culverts that are near their life cycle end and the ground is melting so the culverts shift and crack and break apart and it's a lot of money to to fix this kind of thing. It's a rigid structure that we put on top of ground that's moving and shifting so so that it when it fails it fails catastrophically and and there's going to be um, cracks that end up in the side of the culvert and then the water moves on the outside of the culvert and erodes the ground away and then the road fails. The Blackstone River is down here. There's about 15 meters difference between the Blackstone and the top of the road and then there's about whatever five or six or whatever meters difference here between the lake. There's pathways that water is flowing down below the road and some of that melts the ice. We don't know exactly what the story is below here but we know that there's also massive ice in the ground here. The highway right away is here. The hazard is the river and all of this ground is settled land claims. So the road is falling into the river. It's probably going to be a cat catastrophic failure that'll happen at one location that'll drain the lake. There's nowhere else to put the road. I like that risk-based approach to things like understanding the traffic, understanding the probability of somebody being injured during a failure, understanding the mechanism of failure, and uh, also understanding what the implications are. In the north, where the extent of transportation network is limited and more vulnerable to disruption, climate change-induced impacts on the system can lead to disruptions to supply chains and passenger flows, which have many economic, social, and cultural consequences for northerners. This means that to ensure transportation networks remain safe and reliable, roads will require increased maintenance to meet functional standards. Okay, so that brings us to my main research objective, uh, which is to quantify the financial impact of climate-induced maintenance activities in the Yukon, and with this financial monitoring approach to determine the vulnerability of existing infrastructure and how we can adapt as climate change progresses. And secondly, the objective is to try to determine how maintenance costs associate with climate data in the study region and in the underlying permafrost. So the data that was used for this project was provided by the Transportation Engineering Branch of the Government of Yukon. And this data set includes uh, the costs of all maintenance activities broken down into specific categories, including gravel resurfacing, dust control, patching of asphalt, and clearing of brush and weeds, just to name a few. But there were four climate-related costs which were extracted from this data set and include snow removal, clearing of culverts, Glacier control, which is associated with icings and occur as a drainage channel from a reservoir become restricted and forces water to the surface and subsequently forming layers of ice, either on top of the road or uh, blocking culverts. Uh, the last category includes clearing of landslides and repair of washouts, which can be triggered as a result of heavy rainfall and unserviceable culvert or flooding. And these damages often occur in highway sections with permafrost as the frozen ground impedes groundwater movement. I also want to note that some of these climate related costs are a result of gradual adjustment to the climate, such as glacier control and snow removal, but events such as slides and washouts are intermittent events um, that occur most often due to heavy rainfall. So presented on the map here is a high resolution empirical statistical model uh, of the distribution of permafrost for southern and central Yukon created by Philip Bonaventure in 2012. And the distribution of permafrost beneath the highway can be divided into four categories. In the continuous zone in purple, permafrost extends between over 90% of all surfaces except for large bodies of water. In the extensive discontinuous zone, uh, in blue shown here, 50 to 90% of the landscape is underlain by permafrost. 
in the sporadic discontinuous zone in green, 10 to 50% of the landscape is underlain by permafrost, and in the isolated patches shown in pink, less than 10% of um, the ground is underlain by permafrost. So this information will be used to determine whether the increases in climate related costs are different in highway sections uh, with or without permafrost. So one of the highways that is included in this study is the Alaska Highway in the southern part of the Yukon. And this highway was constructed during World War II to connect the US to Alaska across Canada and spans a total of 2,232 kilometers. But for this case study, I'll only be focusing on the westernmost portion of the highway in the Yukon. So the route traverses thermally sensitive discontinuous permafrost with a mean annual temperature close to zero degrees Celsius and therefore is very sensitive to disturbance. However, the road is paved to allow for a design speed of 100 kilometers per hour using bitumen surface treatment and asphalt. The road is maintained by three maintenance camps, including Beaver Creek, Destruction Bay, and Haines Junction. And the daily average traffic is between 150 and 299 vehicles per day, with lower counts in the winter season than in the summer. So presented in the figures here are some of the results of the climate related costs uh, for the Beaver Creek section on the Alaska Highway from 2006 to 2020. And these costs are presented using 2020 equivalent Canadian dollars. And we can see here that 15 years ago, total climate related costs were at about $100,000 and have increased uh, to about $300,000 in 2020 with an average rate of increase of $14,500 per year. And the average breakdown of these costs over this time period are shown in the pie chart on the right, with the majority spent on snow removal, about 9% spent on glacier control, and culvert activities and slides and washouts accounting for only about 2% of the total costs. Um, and this figure here, uh, the climate related cost as a proportion of the total operation and maintenance cost for the Beaver Creek section are shown. And we can see that in 2006, climate related costs were only about 9% of the total, total budget, but have increased to about 35% of the total budget in 2020. Uh, so the second case study looks at the Dempster Highway from kilometer zero, which starts about 40 kilometers south of uh, Dawson City to kilometer 465, which ends right at the border with the Northwest Territories. And the decision to build the Dempster Highway was made in 1958 by the Canadian government to provide an overland supply link to southern Canada and ease the extraction of natural resources. However, the road wasn't officially opened until 1979. So this highway is entirely lane, uh, underlain by continuous permafrost. The road surface is entirely made of gravel and has a maximum speed limit of 90 kilometers per hour. The highway is maintained by three maintenance camps, including Klondike, Ogilvy, and Eagle Plains. And a daily average traffic is less than 50 vehicles per day. So these figures are similar to the ones that were presented on a previous slide, but are shown for the Ogilvy section on the Dempster Highway instead. And the first thing to note is that the climate related costs are much more expensive than on the Alaska Highway and range between $300,000 and $1.2 million since 2006. The average breakdown of these costs displayed on the pie chart also differ compared to the Alaska Highway section with slides and washouts amounting to about 20% of the costs. I also want to note here that in 2014, which was the most expensive year to date, the cost of slides and washouts amounted to $800,000 out of the $1.2 million spent that year. And similarly, in the second most expensive year, 2017, slides and washouts amounted to $650,000. Um, so the solid line here represents the average rate of increase of $14,000 per year. And this in, uh, excludes 2014 and 2017, showing that even without these large magnitude events, there's still a gradual increase in the costs. 
Uh, the dashed line includes these events and shows an average increase rate of $25,500 per year. And with this, I just want to illustrate the need to not only manage the gradual adjustments to these costs, but also the necessity to build resilience to these types of large magnitude events that are very expensive as a increase in frequency due to climate change. Uh, so when looking at the climate related costs as a proportion of the total operation and maintenance costs at the Ogilvy section, we can see that climate related costs since 2006 can account from 25% all the way up to 75% of the total maintenance costs. And again, to note here, slides and washouts alone in 2014 accounted for 42% of all costs. So using this slide here, um, I just want to emphasize the vast variability of physiographic conditions of the natural environment that these highways traverse through. Um, and this means that the maintenance practices and the challenges that are faced to maintain these highways varies from site to site. And in the case of Yukon highways, this means from section to section, um, as illustrated by the differences shown in the breakdown of costs in the Breaver Creek section and the Ogilvy section. Um, and that means that there's a necessity for configuration and that there's no one size fits all approach that can be applied to increase the resiliency of these highways to the changing climate. So in conclusion, the key takeaway messages from my presentation are that climate change is increasing highway maintenance costs in the Yukon. Uh, there's substantial uh, variability in the natural environment, which means that climate-related maintenance varies from site to site. Thirdly, climate-related maintenance is increasing as a proportion of the total costs and can account for up to 75% of all maintenance. And lastly, using the example of costly slides and washouts to illustrate how we consider and manage large magnitude events that are occurring with increasing frequency and how to increase resiliency of infrastructure to such events. That brings us to my, the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Astrid. Um, I can't turn on my camera, but maybe if um, Denis could, could do that, I can share my video. But um, thank you, Astrid and Trevor, for um, your great talks. Um, they're really interesting, and I really like the, the visuals and, and the videos that you presented. Um, and I see we already have a few questions in the chat, so um, I'll just read them out and whoever they're addressed to can, can answer them. Um, so the first is, could Astrid explain again what is involved in glacier control? Um, so what happens is that um, because of the changing climate, there's not an immediate freeze up um, of reservoirs. So what happens is, um, as a drainage channel uh, becomes blocked and because it's in permafrost and because the active layer, so the ground above permafrost is the only infiltration layer. Um, so the water tends to um, be forced up to the surface and then subsequently forms uh, layers of ice either on top of the road surface or they can form inside a culvert. Um, and then this, these layers of ice can build up to entirely block the culvert. Thank you. Um, another hey, question. Ava, yes. you, could, you should be able to turn on your video now. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so another question for you, Astrid. Uh, climate change related rapid temperature shifts uh, also affect surface damage. Um, do they, I guess? Um, I'm not exactly sure what's meant by the question. I don't know if further explanation can be given. I'm not sure if the question is asking, does, um, do rapid temperature shifts affect the surface? Oh, the surface damage? Of, of roads? Yeah, so. Um, yeah, so it depends if there's permafrost or a large amount of ground ice beneath the roads, um, but permafrost is thawing at a rate that is um, 
uh, lagging behind how much the temperature is changing. So what we're seeing now and how the permafrost is thawing now is what is due to the temperature increase that's already happened. So there's a lag to the rate at which it's thawing. Right. Do you know, um, like what, what is the lag approximately? Or maybe that's hard to say. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, no. Okay, thanks. Um, and what was special, I think this is for Astro as well, about 2014 and 2017 that led to the greater slides and washouts? Um, so I still have to do some further investigation into the climate data and really associate it with um, the rainfall, but we have seen that 2014 that year was a year with very heavy precipitation, probably one of the heaviest um, that we have on record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a question for Trevor: um, What were the wind gust, uh, what were the gust speeds compared to the hourly winds in extreme events? So gust gust winds versus hourly winds. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, the way Environment Canada uh, gives the wind speeds, they don't give gust speed as well as uh, sustained wind speed. Um, they usually just give like a max gust speed for the entire day. Um, but sort of in the data I've been looking at, the max wind speed, like sustained wind speed I've noticed is around, uh, around about 120 kilometers that I've seen so far in the data I've looked at. Um, but I know the gusts I've seen reach 150 to 160 kilometers per hour. Um, but I, I think the news stations might allow us to look at gusts rather than just sustained wind speed as well. Just for my information, uh, what is a, a gust would be over a shorter period of time, mm -hmm. correct? So. Yeah, so I, I think if I remember correctly, the way Environment Canada does it is they look at the 10 minutes leading up to the hour uh, and then sustained wind speed is over, I believe it's a one or two minute time period and then gusts would probably be, you know, maybe five or 10 seconds, but I, I'm not, 100 percent sure on that so don't quote me on that yeah might depend i guess on the weather station mm -hmm. and how it's set up yeah um clarification i think about the previous question about surface damage um if we have rapid changes on a daily basis sometimes how does the freeze melt freeze melts process damage if that effect that happens in a much higher frequency um, so we are seeing uh, more longitudinal cracks in the road and uh, when Trevor and I were also uh, driving across the highways this summer, the Alaska Highway, which is meant to be driven at a speed of 100 kilometers, it, you weren't even able to drive it at that uh, speed just because of the huge cracks and the fluctuating surface um, that you had there. Uh, another question for Trevor, I think, have you considered wind speeds associated with land areas and ocean area, uh, land areas, land areas and land areas associated with oceans? Uh, well, I mean, my research is more focused um, on Hurricane Alley, so very local scale. Um, but I did mention when I was using windy.com just to look at what it would project for wind speed. Um, you can see that over oceans, it's typically much stronger winds. Uh, and I think that's mainly due to friction. So over land or you know, plants, uh, topography, which will slow the wind down, but over oceans, uh, much flatter areas that uh, can have higher wind speeds. Um, I think that's kind of what the question was getting at, if I understood it correctly. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm more focused on the local scale, just in Hurricane Alley. Right. Yeah. Um, I had a question, I guess, related to that. So uh, you mentioned using Windy. Um, I think Windy, they, they, they pull data from a few different. Yeah, there are um, a number of different sources. Yeah. Um, so do you know how the grid cell size, say, for the models used by Windy compares to ECCC? Uh, I think, well, some of them are larger, so Environment Canada is usually on the order of 10 to 15 kilometers. Um, I think Windy has one, the, the, like, well, the, the sort of normal one, like 
what right an would you ERA go five, I think? Have a, I think it's around nine or ten kilometers. Um, but there is one I think that's five kilometers. There's one which is twenty kilometers. Uh, so there are you know a sort of range of different uh, grid cell scales, um, mm -hmm. but none of them are as uh, fine as the ones CBC use. Right. I see another question for Astrid. Um, it seems that the damages are much greater with washouts and heavy rain. What proportion of the precipitation is rain versus snow now? And what sort of trend do you see for more rain um, above zero degrees Celsius in the future? Um, so that's a really great question. Um, we're now currently in the process of kind of going through that data and looking at how much is rain and how much is snow, but we are seeing um, an increase, especially in August and September rainfall, uh, which is that shoulder season um, where more of the snow is turning into rain. Um, but definitely the trends that we see in the future, um, especially with more uh, heavy rainfall events, those slides and washouts, um, I think will definitely become more common. Are you able to see, um, like from the data source for like the costs for each year are you able to see like when during the year the costs are higher or lower like in different seasons or is it just kind of yeah, average so for the point the costs are all given um on a monthly basis so you can see exactly uh what how much they spent every month and even what they spent it on okay yeah. interesting uh is there much much is there much washout from melting snow in the spring um, I'm not exactly sure about that. I do know that this summer there was very bad floods because um, of the heavy snowfall and especially because of the temperature change and the snow that was at high um, altitudes in the mountains was also um, melting. So that caused a huge amount of water uh, to flood the area. Um. I have a question maybe for Trevor. Um, it's interesting hearing you talk about hydraulic jumps. I remember learning about that. And so the dynamics in my undergrad, uh, but related to oceanography. Um, but I, you might have mentioned this, but uh, maybe I missed it. But are there any um, like environmental factors that affect whether a hydraulic jump will form or not um, down, down slope, I guess, of the ridge? Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of it, but it depends on how fast uh, the wind speed is, um, if there are any objects in the way. So, you know, it, well, in Hurricane Alley, it would be if there's, you know, a small hill or a ridge or something, but in other locations, you know, it could be a large urban area, maybe, um, or a vegetated area or something. But uh, yeah, um, not really sure how else to answer that question, sorry. That's okay. No, I was just curious. Um, oh, I think there's another question. Uh, Trevor, have you been seeing wind speeds increasing over time? Um, so at Rock River, we only have data since July 2006, I believe it is. Um, and then the other stations, you know, they came online maybe around 2010, 2014. Um, and I haven't fully gone through all the data yet, but I think wind speed, I've noticed, is more just variable from year to year, uh, maybe related to teleconnections such as ENSO or something. Um, but I haven't seen like any big increase or decrease. It's more just variable from year to year. Yeah, yeah it's hard to see. I would imagine it'd be hard to see long term trends in wind speeds because they can be variable on such different scales. Yeah, especially since the longest record we have is only about 15, 16 years at this point. Right. Uh, but yeah, maybe a decade or so down the line, that's something that could be looked into. Yeah. Um, for Astrid, what adaptive options would you recommend given the, high, the rising costs for maintaining roads at high latitudes under climate change? Um, so there are a lot of um, adaptive options when it comes to preserving the permafrost underneath the road. Uh, for example, thermosiphons, which are which are used to preserve the permafrost, but are very, very expensive. I think there is a 500 meter section on the Alaska Highway and 
think there's 52 thermosiphons, don't quote me on this, placed there and it was about $4 million. So that is a very, very costly option. Um, but as far as the slides and washouts, there isn't, there isn't any ad adaptive options that are possible. Um, but what I think is that it just will require a lot more planning, a lot more site investigation um, to really ensure that where the road is placed um, is the best option. Right. Um, for Trevor, are there any plans to put wind breaks or fences along the highway to reduce crosswinds uh, and impacts on large trucks? Um, I haven't heard of any specifically to act as wind breaks. Um, but the other master student from Carleton, I mentioned Jen Humphreys, um, her research was actually looking on the effect of snow fences uh, and how that affected snow deposition and ground temperatures. Um, and the feedback we got from the maintenance crews on that was that it actually prevented a lot of drifting snow over the road and stopped it before it reached the road. Um, but as far as wind breaks to prevent high winds at the road, I haven't heard any plans of uh, any plans to install any wind breaks. But they, they certainly have been used to present prevent uh, drifting and blowing snow. Interesting. Um, for Astrid, uh, regarding the maintenance costs, if there was no climate change, would a lot of these costs still be incurred? Um, in other words, how much of the increases have been caused by climate change and how many, how much, I guess, would already be there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's what kind of what I showed earlier in the slides, the proportion um, is meant to show is that the proportion was 9% back in 2005, six, and has now grown to 35% um, out of the total budget. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat now, and I know we're coming up just past one o'clock right now. Um, should I hand things back over to Barry now? Oh, I think you muted yourself, Barry. <clears throat> okay. Are we there? Okay. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, uh, very much for your contributions today and uh, very enjoyable uh, to be talking about a region of the world that uh, I know is very close to Carlton and its researchers uh, over, I'm going to say decades, which it has been. So thank you very much for sharing that. And to everybody out there, um, our next meetings are listed on the CMOS Ottawa website, but the next meeting, our next luncheon meeting uh, via Zoom will be on uh, Thursday, 17th of February. And it will be by another Carlton professor, uh, Ellen Humphreys, and on peatland and tundra methane flux studies that she's been involved in. So please uh, mark it on your calendar and feel free to uh, join us. And again, thank you very much to everyone and uh, have a good day. And I hope it warms up for those of you in, I guess, all of the regions that are listening. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone.